reading of our Bibles. Well, give you a little behind the scenes as we elders are planning out services and sermons and all that. I was originally intending, of course, next week, Christmas Eve, to be preaching out of Isaiah chapter 9. And yet, just as thinking over the that passage and the realities that we celebrate at Christmas next week, of course, was intending on con- continuing in Matthew chapter 5, but as I was thinking about Christmas, I was realizing how Christmas, perhaps more than any other Christian holiday, is susceptible to get watered down. Right? We forget why we celebrate it in the first place. Like, what's the big deal with Christ's birth in the first place? Its significance, its glory, why do we make a holiday out of it? And really, one of the, one of the reasons why we often forget these realities is we forget why it was necessary in the first place. Why did Jesus have to come? What's the the point of the incarnation, we might ask? And this is what we want to see today. We want to ask, how can we recover a right view of what we're going to celebrate next week? How can our hearts glory in this reality of the birth of Christ, of his incarnation? And again, to rightly grasp that, to rightly get our hearts aligned with God's will, to rightly know why Christmas was necessary in the first place. Perhaps the best place to answer that is found right at the beginning of your Bibles, in the book of Genesis, the first three chapters. So once you arrive there, let's go before the Lord. Ask Him to bless our time in the Word, and then we'll see what He has to say from His Word. Lord God, teach us now, we pray, out of this literally foundational passage of Scripture, lift up our eyes to Christ. May our hearts be warmed by the reality of what you've promised in this text. And may it cause our hearts to realize your incomprehensible grace to sinners through your Son and his suffering, death, and victory over Satan and all his works. And so this we pray, Lord, teach us from your word. We pray in your name. Amen. Now, when I said turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, or to the beginning of your Bibles, I meant literally the beginning of your Bibles. So look, if you would, at Genesis chapter 1. I'd like us to kind of ramp up, if you will, to the specific text we're going to look at this morning in Genesis 3. Because we need to get this context. Our specific passage this morning is going to be dark. It's going to be in probably the most consequential chapter of the Bible. One of the most harrowing and dark chapters of the Bible. But we need to understand why that's the case. And that's found two chapters before. Look at the first verse of the Bible. We're all familiar. It begins with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. goes on to describe how God creating the earth in six literal days forms, you see in verse 3, the light. And he says, there was light, verse 4, God saw that the light was good. Verse 5, called the light day, the darkness night, evening, morning, one day. What happens next? Well, he creates the expanse in the midst of the waters, divides the waters. Verse 8 calls it heaven. There was evening and morning a second day. Makes the dry land in verse 9. God says it, and it was so, that pattern there. Calls that dry land in verse 10, earth, gathering of the waters, he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. Verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit. And so that's what happened. Verse 12, the earth brought that vegetation, brought those plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit, and God saw that it was good. Verse 14 and on creates the stars in the heavens, the lights in the expanse, two great lights, right? 
And it was, we see at the end of verse 18, once again, he creates, it happens, and he saw that it was good on that fourth day. He creates the creatures, verse 20, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, birds flying above the earth and the heavens. And so God created birds and swarming creatures and all of them after their own kind. He blesses them, blesses this creation by saying, verse 22, be fruitful. Multiply, fill the waters, birds, creatures, you name it. Verse 24, the living creatures, the cattle, creeping things, the beasts of the earth, saw that it was good. End of verse 25, you get in the pattern, by the way. Notice this. We have creation here. We'll get to man in a moment. But it's very clear certain realities. Very clear the context that's being set up here. This is a good creation. But above all that, that's found in verse 1. God is sovereign over all this. He's the authority over all this. Why? Because he has existed from all eternity. And because he created all things. And therefore he owns it. This is one of the fundamental facts, one of the fundamental realities of life itself, folks. The foundation of all philosophy and knowledge and everything. God is. <laughs> And he's sovereign and he's creator. That's what Colossians 1.16, amongst many other verses, points out. All things were created for him and through him. It wasn't that just he was the, the one who made everything, the one who designed everything and just let it be, do its own thing. No, it was created for him. And it's all under his sovereign authority. He defines existence. He defines reality. He defines all of it because it's his creation. But all the more, what did God create? What did this sovereign create? What is he in authority over? Well, Moses made clear over and over, God made something and he saw, because he made it, that it was good. What a word. Huge word, really. So much that can be said about it. But what are we talking about here? What does it mean for something to be good? Does it just mean that it was designed well, right? It's efficient or it does the job? That's certainly the case, but that's so, there's so much more to that word. When it says God created and it was good, every aspect, every detail of his creation, including, as we'll see in a second in verse 31, everything, including man, was very good. What does that mean? Was it Adam? Was it man? Was it any... Of the creatures that God made that define what good was? No. You want to know what good is? <laughs> you want to know why it's a good creation? It's because God said it was. In other words, what is good? It's that which conforms to God. That which conforms to His righteousness. To His beauty, to His joy, to His majesty, to His glory. If it aligns with God and His will and His character... It is good. This creation is a, is a good creation. It's beautiful. It's full of his wisdom, his knowledge, his brilliance, his glory, his majesty. Particularly in the pinnacle of creation. The creation of man. Look at verse 26. And then, after all that, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Again, so much we can get into there, but this is suffice to say, more than any other part of creation, far more, man, created both male and female, as we'll see, is like God in certain ways. No, not in every way. We are, cre we are the creature, he is the creator. But we reflect God and his character. Not only that, but we are almost his regents. His, his under rulers, if you would. Look at the rest of the verse. Let them, those made in my image, what a privilege, what a glory, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, man, and male and female, he created them. God blessed them. Is that a good thing? Of course. God bless them. 
And he said to them this, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky. Rule over every living thing that moves on the earth. And notice, this is just his kindness. Giving them such blessing and joy and privilege. Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed on the surface of the earth. Every tree. It shall be food for you, and to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth which has life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so... Notice, this is a blessing God. This is not an angry, mean ogre up in some castle, <laughs> raining down curses upon his creatures. No. This is a God that blesses. This is the God of, of beauty and joy. And he pours that out upon every aspect of his creation. This is indeed, verse 31, God saw all that he made. And because he made it, behold, it was very good. This continues on, by the way. Gets into more detail on that specific day in chapter 2. Moses goes on, talks about just the, the way that God took care of the creation in verse 4 and 5. Mist used to rise above the earth, on the earth, water the whole surface of the ground, right? God taking care of it, blessing this creation, forming man, verse 7, chapter 2, from the dust of the ground. Again, we, we are the creature. We're but dust, but God blesses that dust creature. What a privilege, what a glory, made in His image poured out all these glorious joys. Literally perfection of life is what creation had. Plants a garden, really almost the capstone, the crown of creation, Eden, and puts man in that almost the perfect of perfect places. Eden. Out of the ground causes every tree to, go, to grow. Notice in verse 9 that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. God didn't create ugly. He created beauty and good things, enjoy, enjoyable things. Creation is a good thing. This is all from God. But notice he says he creates the tree of life, verse 9, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll get to that in a second. But again, notice verse 10 to 14, just the refulgence of this creation. It's abundant. It's overflowing. It's a place of, verse 12, of diamonds and flowing rivers. And again, verse 15, God places man into this paradise, into this Eden, into this perfect place. Everything Adam and Eve could ever want and ever desire in fellowship with God, all here. It's perfect. But he gives him a command, does he not? Look at verse 16. He has a mission. God gives man a mission to cultivate it, to keep it, to, to rule over, exercise dominion over the rest of creation. But he says, listen, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Again, notice, have at it. It's yours to enjoy. I created it for, for beauty, for glory. Go, eat, enjoy, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So the rest of the chapter goes on to describe the creation of Eve, the creation of woman. Again, the perfect one flesh companion. All the other animals, right, male, female, all the way down. And for man, created this special one for him. Woman, bone of my bones, verse 23, flesh of my flesh, to help him in the task that God gave him. So in every way, every dimension of this creation, in this human relationship, in their mission, in the joys that they had, in the glorious, perfect fellowship that they had with God, in the materials, in the creatures, in the plants, in the sky. It's perfect. It's glorious. You could not make anything better. It was very good. Perfection in two chapters. And this is emphasized throughout Scripture, by the way. 
Turn, if you would, just for a moment to Psalm 8. It's a short one, but I want us to read the whole thing and see, because David here, he's just echoing what Moses wrote down in these two chapters of Genesis. And he uses it as a platform for worship. David says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, Psalm 8 says. You have displayed your splendor, your glory, your worth, your majesty in the heavens. Above the heavens, from the mouth of infants and babes, you've established strength. He goes on to say in verse 3, when I consider your heavens, when I look, and he's talking, by the way, after the fall, but still, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? And yet you took, think of it, this creature of dust, You've made him a little lower than the angels, and you crown him with glory and majesty. Unbelievable. That's what God did. We're at the pinnacle of creation, of earthly creation. God didn't have to do this. Made us, as it says, verse 5, lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and majesty. He could have just said, hey, here's your job, go do it. But no, what does he say? Glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. What a privilege. What a glory that mankind has. All sheep, all oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the sea. And this drives David in light of Genesis 1 and 2. In light of the glories and the majesties that God has crowned mankind with. He says, Oh Lord, our Lord, verse 9, how majestic is, is your name in all the earth. Wow, what a God. What a privilege. What a glory. We need to emphasize this, folks, because Genesis 1 to 2, before we get to Genesis 3, is communicating this, is communicating those truths of Psalm 8. This is a glorious, majestic scenario. None like it in all of human history, at least so far. <laughs> That's the point. Man has been so particularly privileged. There's so much glory given. And furthermore, even in just in terms of his own relationship between him and God, his own status, if you would, Adam and Eve, man in Genesis 1 and 2, they had, there was no room for improvement. They were at the pinnacle of creation. It was perfect. Everything about their lives was perfect. It was all satisfying. Don't have to turn here, but listen to Psalm 104, verse 24. O oh Lord, how many are your works, and in, in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Verse 27, what about those possessions, those creatures? What do they do? They all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, and they are satisfied with good. This was God's intention for man, to be satisfied in him and through him, in creation, as God provides all that they need. You get in the picture? <laughs> this is great. This is amazing. There's none like it. What more could man want? What more could Adam and Eve want? <laughs> these psalms echo simply what Moses was writing down in narrative they have everything perfection, literally everything God indeed, remember, gives them a command but I want to emphasize when he says in Genesis 2, 16 to 17 not to eat from this particular tree gives them a clear command and by the way uh, other theologians will make it a covenant of works of Adam and all that. No, it's just a command. This is my command. I'm giving to you. But I want to emphasize, though, what he says at the beginning. All the trees of, of the creation you may eat from freely. God's commands, whether at this time or afterwards, it's all part of that good creation. They're good. They're not bad. 
for God to prohibit this from them is not him being mean. No, it's, it's for their good. Just as if we would say, hey, listen, the law is prohibiting you from driving on the opposite end of the road. You might say, oh, that's restricting my freedom, or I want to drive on the opposite end of the road. What's going to happen if you have your way? <laughs> You're not going to be satisfied. <laughs> good will not come from that. In other words, it is for your good to keep according to that command. Right? If, your, if your child came up to you and said, hey, I want to eat the dirt outside. Forget the cookies, forget the dinner, forget this or that. I want, to, I want to chow down on some of this mud. I really want that. It looks cool. It's, I like it. You telling them, you prohibiting them from doing so, is that you being mean? No, it's for their good, for actually for their joy, ultimate joy. And that's the same deal here in Genesis 2.17. It's for their good, it's for their joy. When we are in right relationship with God, when we walk according to His ways, even just the one that Adam and Eve had, that is for their good. Again, so this is all in this perfect creation. If you read through Genesis 1-2, to this should be echoing in your hearts. The privileges and glories that man has. The pinnacle of creation. God satisfying all their needs because he created them and he knows their frame he knows exactly what his creatures are and he's given them everything glory majesty and just one simple command again for their good but you know what happens don't you look at chapter 3 In light of that, and that's why I took some time to go through this, in light of this perfection, in light of absolute glory and majesty, here, Adam and Eve, is everything you could ever want or need. All from me and for me, for my glory, God says. And here's the reaction. Now the serpent... Oh, he was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had, God had made. And as you probably well know, if not, this ain't just any old serpent. This is the serpent, the accuser of the brethren, the enemy. And he comes and he says to the woman, Indeed, Hebrew term there, really? Just, just to clarify, help me out here if you would. Indeed, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Again, this would, if we had the time to go into <laughs> the subtlety of Satan and all this, and temptations to sin, just as we saw he did with Jesus in Matthew 4, remember that? It's the same deal. He's not coming with any assault, spiritual assault against God necessarily. Just ask him to clarify for me, if you would. Just walk me through this, if you would. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree of the garden? Is, is, is that the case? Is he restricting your lifestyle? Is he restricting your freedom? The woman says, well, no. From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you shall surely die. But the serpent, oh, he takes the next step. He kind of cracked the door open a little bit. This is where he kind of puts his, puts his shoe in and starts to enter in. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. Come on, give me a break. That can't be the case. You know why that's not the case? You know why you're not going to die, Eve? Because God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you're going to then be like God, knowing good and evil. Uh. He's introducing doubt here, is he not? Folks, you need to understand something about sin and temptation. What you're seeing right here is the perfect essence of what every sin and temptation is. What your flesh, the world, the devil, 
is trying to make you do to sin. And that's, don't believe God. Don't trust God. Something about what he said is not quite right. What is sin at its root? It's lawlessness, as 1 John says. But beyond that, it's just not believing God. <laughs> I'm going to believe myself. I'm going to believe the, the serpent. I'm going to believe you name it. That's what it is. And that's what the devil is introducing into the scenario here, folks. No, that's not quite right. Introducing doubt into God's character. Again, he, he knows that you'll be like him. So he's this miserly God, sinfully jealous God. He doesn't want you to know good or evil. He's, he's again, he's restricting you, your lifestyle, your freedom. That's why he's not doing it. In other words, in contrast to what we've already seen in these first two chapters, God doesn't want your good. Genesis 1-2, to two, everything is for their good unto his glory. Satan says, Genesis 3, no, it's not for your good. You see, that's what sin is, not believing God, doubting God. In fact, as we won't get to, the, to this verse today, but notice in verse 17, once they, sadly, sin, God goes to Adam, the responsible party, the ultimate, the leader in the situation. And what does he say? He says, why did you sin? Because you listened to the voice of your wife. <laughs> That's not an anti-female sentiment or something like that. What, what the Lord is pointing out to Adam is this. You didn't listen to my voice. You listened to somebody else's voice. Don't care if it was Satan, don't care if it was your wife. You listened to somebody else's voice, rather than what I clearly said. Sin is not believing God. But at, up to this point, at least, at verse 5, chapter 3, man, Adam or Eve, hasn't quite yet, at least clearly, been sin in the picture. But well, that changes subtly in verse 6. Because what should have the reaction been? No. <laughs> You're wrong. For God has said. Again, <laughs> we're in Matthew, and I can't help be reminded of Matthew chapter 4, which we saw. What does Jesus say when Satan doubts God, when Satan causes him, pushes him? No, don't believe God, don't trust God. What does Jesus say? It is written. In other words, no, this is what God said. And that settles it. I'm going to believe that. I'm going to go with that. Because he is right. He is creator. He is truth. But is that what Eve does? No. In fact, we get a little insight into her heart. Moses, as it were, takes us in there. And he says, when... The woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Notice, when she sees that tree, if she was obeying the Lord, she should have said, you know what, it looks nice, but God has said, I'm not going to eat from it. But what does verse 6 kind of bring us into? She wasn't looking at what God said. <laughs> she wasn't looking at, here's what God says, this is what the tree is, I'm not going to eat from it. No, it's, well, would you look at that? It is good for food. It is a delight to my eyes. It is desirable to make me wise. Drifting away, even in the beginning part of verse 6. And that desire, as James 1 says, that desire in the heart gives birth to action, to sin, in, in that she takes from its fruit and eats. And she gave also to her husband with her. Adam was there the whole time, abdicating his duty right there. And he ate also. What happens? And the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. 
This is the deceitfulness of sin, folks. It promises everything, and it gives nothing in truth. Satan lied, and this is what happens. This is what sin does. And again, I want all this to be done, all these truths to be understood in the backdrop of Genesis 1-2. to They had everything, folks. They had glory and majesty. They had perfect satisfaction, top to bottom. There was no aspect of their existence in Adam and Eve's existence that was not everything. But they just wanted more. And it all started when, I'm not going to believe God. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to follow my sinful desires. And what happens in the rest of the, of the, of the passage it's the wicked folly of sin. They just go deeper in it, believe it or not. Check out verse 8. What happens? They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, whereas before it was intimate fellowship, in, infinite joy, infinite love, infinite closeness. What do they do now? Hide, run away from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Lord God calls to the man rhetorically. He's, om he's omniscient, he knows. But he's drawing out the purposes of his heart. Adam, where are you? And he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Some license here in what I'm about to say, but I would dare say that was never a word in Adam's vocabulary before sin. Being afraid of God, wanting to get away from God. That never, ever happened. But now it does because of sin. Because of this black wickedness. I was afraid of you because I was naked and exposed, so I hid myself. And he said, God did, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Here would be a great opportunity for repentance. Yes, Lord, I have sinned against you. But what does Adam do? Passes the buck. Oh, the woman noticed that you gave to me. Lord, you're, you're the one at fault. It was your deal. The woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. I'm a victim here, God. Not only of my wife, but also of you. Notice again, deeper and deeper in the black wickedness of sin. Okay? And the Lord God turns to the woman, what is this that you have done? She does the same thing. The woman said, oh, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Again, playing the victim. No, I'm not at fault. I haven't sinned. I'm just, I'm a victim here. Indeed, she was deceived. But she still should have obeyed. Still culpable. So the Lord God then turns to the serpent. And before we get to that, I just want us to, to marinate on what we just read, folks. Think about the folly of sin. Again, so many opportunities for repentance. So many opportunities to stop. Not to try to hide themselves from God. What a foolish thing that is. Not to try to pass the buck. Not to try to lie to the omniscient God. What foolishness that is. Again, this is just awful. I would dare say the contrast between Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3 is some of the most stark in the whole Bible. Just so perfect, so right, so everything is where it should be. It's glorious. Psalm 8, like we read, how majestic, awesome. And then Genesis 3, slamming the brakes, as it were, to this blackness. and It's terrible. And it just goes deeper and deeper. And we're, we're only 13 verses in. This is what sin does. This is the blackness of sin. This is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. 1 John 2.16 This is Romans 1, actually, in many ways. Notice what Adam and Eve have done. Suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Exchanging the Creator who is blessed forever, i.e. the source of all good and joy and majesty and glory and perfection, 
They said, I don't want the feast. I want the dirt. <laughs> to go back to that illustration. Exchanging the creator who is blessed forever, Romans 1, with the creature. In other words, themselves, their own desires. Suppressing the truth. You name it. It's all right here in these few verses. This is awful. But what does God do with this? At this point, again, he knows everything that's happened. He's not asking these questions to get information, by the way. He's drawing out the purposes of their heart, and he's seen <laughs> they're not repentant. And so he curses them. He brings proper discipline, which is what the rest of the chapter unfolds, right? And you know it well to the woman, pain in childbirth, her own sinfulness now bringing sinfulness into her own heart, and even that, that one flesh relationship, again, that pinnacle of pinnacles in, in creation. Now it would be antagonism. You can see that in verse 16. Verse 17 on describes how the labor of man, how his job to rule over the earth, to exercise dominion, which man still has, of course. Now it's going to be hard because of your sin. So the Lord gives the proper punishment for sin. And he casts them out of the garden. And that's where we've been since, the, since this time in human history. We're all still living in a post fall post Genesis 3 world but yet before all that he talks to that old snake he talks to Satan go back to verse 14 and 15 and check it out the Lord God said to the serpent he first curses him right gives him that punishment because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. But in the midst of this black chapter, Genesis 3, comes a ray of light. Believe it or not, in verse 15. This is our text for the rest of our time this morning. What does God say? Speaking again to the serpent, he says, and I'm going to put enmity, hostility between you and the woman, that woman whom you deceived, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. I might be saying, Danny, what, it, what light? <laughs> That's, I, I hear enmity and bruising. What's good about this? Well, we've got to look at a few terms here. Because this is one of the most significant verses in the whole Bible. From this, if you would, so many major themes in all of Scripture come start right here. And in many ways it begins with the term right in the middle, seed, zerah in the Hebrew, offspring. Notice those. Offspring. The seed of the woman, your seed, the serpent's seed. The seed of Eve on one end. The mother of all mankind, right? And the seed of Satan. And notice really the progress of this verse. You can in many ways kind of divide it in three, three portions. I'm going to put enmity. Notice between you and the woman. So notice how the verse progresses from a hostility, from an enmity between the serpent and the woman to enmity between the serpent's seed and Eve's seed. Notice the middle, right? Between your seed and her seed. But then it all culminates, it all points to, it all comes together ultimately in an enmity, in many ways a battle if you would, an enmity between the seed of the woman and the serpent himself, not, not just his seed, but the serpent himself. Why do I say the seed of the woman? Notice what it says at the end of verse 15. Again, her seed, your seed, all that, but notice then it says, same sentence, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Very interesting. 
And the reason it's interesting is because the seed of the serpent, that's a group, that's a category of people, all those who really follow in the deception of Satan, who rebel against their creator. Right? It kind of reminds me a little bit of John chapter 8, when Jesus is condemning the Pharisees, the Sadducees, etc. And he calls them, hey, you are just like your father the devil. He is the father of lies. He is the, a murderer from the beginning, talking about this. And you're just like him. You are of your father the devil. <laughs> to put it in Genesis 3 language, you are of the seed of the serpent. So we're talking about a group and a category there, but it says of the seed of the woman, it's a he. It's an individual, very specifically. Who is this? Because this is all that Moses here says. This is all that God gives to Adam and Eve. This is all the information they had about this individual. That's all they knew. It was an individual of the seed of the woman promised that he would save from the serpent. He would deal with this enmity. He would deal with this hostility. He would be the one to fix, if you would, this problem of problems. That's what verse 15 says, but that's it. But if you keep reading in Genesis and throughout the Old Testament, it's almost like, again, it starts off as a little, little light, if you would, and brightens more and more. The picture, if you would, you go from a small perspective on a portrait, and it slowly unfolds till you get the whole picture. Even in just the book of Genesis itself. Come along, if you would, to Genesis 22. It's a very important and rich theme of the seed. It goes in all kinds of different places, but just to, to focus our time. It goes all the way through Genesis, even back in chapter 15. You can read that if you'd like in your own time. But notice at verse 18, same exact word, because then the Lord now speaks to Abraham, calls Abraham out of idolatry, out of the nations, and he says, in your seed, in your offspring, in your Zerah, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Interesting. This is, again, so much we can get into here. This is about the Abrahamic covenant. This is the, the promise, the framework that God has put together for Abraham, and this is the center of the promise, really. Not only that he would be the father of the nation Israel, from whom all these blessings would come, but also, in your seed, same exact word, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So not just Israel, but all the earth. Everybody will be included in this blessing. Notice now. So we have the seed of the woman. That's all the information we had in Genesis 3. But guess what? We're all the seed of Eve. <laughs> we all come from Adam and Eve. But notice it kind of focuses in now. The seed of Abraham now. And what would this seed do? He would be the source of universal blessing, of universal salvation. He would be the one to restore this relationship between God and His people. The ones who've sinned against Him. But guess what? You keep on going through Genesis, you get near the end. In chapter 49, verse 10, it goes from Abraham, who is the father of the twelve tribes. We all know that. And it narrows then into a man of those 12 tribes called Judah. And in Genesis 49.10, it speaks of his seed from the tribe of Judah would come forth a ruler. And it says he's going to be called Shiloh. That means peace in Hebrew. He's going to come. So interesting. We're kind of narrowing in. Seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, seed of Judah. The one who would bring peace, ultimate peace ultimate rule and this is very much carried over Abraham Judah to one of Judah's descendants a little old man named David Psalm 89 for example excellent one to read in your own time Psalm 89 verse 3 I have made a covenant with my chosen I have sworn to David my servant I will establish, this is what God promised to David, I will establish, guess what? Your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. This is the theme. 
that picks up all the way through the Bible. This is the seed of the woman. This is the seed of Abraham. This is the seed of Judah. This is the seed of David. One of your seed. Your line. I will establish that forever. It's not going to end. That throne, unlike all the other kingdoms and authorities of the world, will be built up forever. That throne will be established. So what have we seen? This seed is going to be the universal ruler who's going to bring in universal peace, universal salvation, extended not only to Jews but to the Gentiles. Who does that sound like, folks? <laughs> That's our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one that we've been seeing over and over and over in the book of Matthew. He's the Messiah. That's who he is. This is the seed of the woman. What does it say that the seed of the woman, our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one, from the line of Judah, from the line of David, the king, Shiloh, what is he going to do in Genesis 3.15? And also, what's going to be done to him? If you're there, notice in that verse. First, what's the serpent going to do to him? Bruise him, it says, on the heel. Now this, of course, this is not a, a fatal wound. This is not a final killing wound, if you would. But no less is a bruising, a crushing, a wound. And this is what the serpent would do to the seed of the woman, to the Messiah, if you would. We know exactly what he's talking about here, do we not? With the, with the help of later revelation, we see this unfolded in the progress of revelation. This is Isaiah 53, folks, is it not? The son was crushed, bruised for our transgressions, and no doubt... In the machinations and the plan of Satan, the servant. Oh, that's the perfect plan. Yes, the seed of the woman destroyed. He was killed. Killed and crushed like no other human individual ever. But again, notice the subtlety, the brilliance. What does God say? You're, yeah, you're going to bruise him. But on the heel... Not a fatal wound, not a final wound. Oh, he will suffer. He will indeed die. He will indeed, in that sense, be crushed. But he is going to do something to you, O oh serpent. To you who have brought in, as it were, sin and temptation into this world. You who is, who is the ultimate enemy of mankind. He's going to bruise you too. Same exact word, by the way. But notice the difference of location. Heel. Not fatal. Head. Crushing of the head. And again, think about a serpent on the ground. You stamp on its head. It ain't coming back from that. This is a final wound, if you would. A fatal crushing this is what the seed of the woman is going to do to you. By the way, this is exactly what 1 John 3, 8 says. The Son of God appeared. He came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what Jesus came to do, folks. Listen, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 2. The author of this text brings together again so many themes I'd love to get into, but for time's sake he brings so many themes together, particularly death. Because that's what goes together. Sin and death. Which is what Satan as the enemy of all mankind introduced into the situation by his temptation and Adam and Eve's fall. But you know what? This is what the seed does with that. It says, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, the Son of God, likewise also partook of the same. He took on human nature, flesh and blood. That through death, bruising of the heel, if I might make a connection, through death, 
through that intruder that death is into the perfect creation, with that he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Notice the crushing of the head of the serpent through suffering. So it's not like, if you would, the bruising of the heel of the seed. It's not like that bruising was a, not a part of the plan, an obstacle that Jesus just somehow overcame. Hebrews says, no, that was all part of the plan. He's going to bruise you on the heel. But that's going to be, as it were, the means by which you shall crush him. Through death, he might render powerless the devil. Destroys the works of the devil. That's what Jesus came to do, folks. And as you read throughout the rest of Scripture, you get to the very end, Revelation chapter 20, Jesus himself will deal personally with Satan himself. He's going to take him after he was bound for a thousand years and he comes out for one last hurrah. <laughs> Pathetic rebellion. Jesus literally just opens his mouth, speaks a word, and it's all destroyed. And he's going to take Satan, take the serpent of old, throw him into the lake of fire forever. Full and final reflection of Genesis 3.15. Folks, this is why Jesus came. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did he take on human nature? Why did he partake of flesh and blood? Genesis 3.15. In the midst of that just black chapter, full of wickedness, not only from Satan, but all the more from man, Adam and Eve, just a mess of wickedness. In contrast to the perfect creation and glory and majesty, this black evil soot of sin, right in the middle of that is this ray of light, God himself saying, I'm going to solve the problem. I'm going to deal with this. That's why I called this Genesis 3.15 really the first Christmas message. <laughs> That's what it is, folks. Even in the midst of just cursing of man and Satan due to the wickedness of sin, God himself extends grace in the form of this promise, folks. Oh, there's going to be, he says... Uh, enmity and hostility between the serpent's seed and all the rest. God says Satan and sin will not have the last word. I'm still the creator. I'm still the sovereign. This is all in the plan. All for my glory because guess what? The seed of the woman who as we find from later revelation is my son, God says, he's going to totally destroy and defeat the servant by means of suffering death by means of taking on Adam and Eve's and all his people's sins. I love what Charles Simeon, he was a contemporary preacher of Charles Spurgeon, just love how he's put all this. Extended quote, but it's a good one. <clears throat> he says, think under what circumstances God made this promise in Genesis 3.15 to man. He had placed our first parents in paradise where there was everything for their happiness. And he himself visited and communed with them as a friend. And yet they, on the very first temptation, violated his express command. And then instead of humbling themselves before him, they fled from him. And when summoned into his presence, they excused themselves and even cast the blame onto him, their God. Simeon then asks the question, what then would you do? What then might we expect that God should have done to them? I mean, just utter rebellion and utter wickedness. Giving them everything and they've returned evil. Simeon says, Surely God should consign them forever to the misery of hell that they deserved. But no. Unsolicited and unsought. Adam and Eve never asked for, for any of this. God promised them a Savior, even His only dear Son, who should rescue both them and all their believing offspring out of the hands of the great adversary. 
And he ends by asking this application question. Now then I ask, if God unsolicited bestowed the Savior himself on these impenitent offenders, will he refuse salvation to any penitent who calls upon him today? Let no sinner in the universe despair, but let everyone see in Genesis 3.15 how abundant and inconceivable is the grace of God. That's what I want to leave ringing in your ears this morning as we close, friends. How abundant and inconceivable is the grace of God. You want to celebrate Christmas, all right? You want to make it matter? You want to glory in Christ throughout the year? doesn't matter if it's the 25th of December or not. You got to get Genesis 3.15. You got to get the glories of the first two chapters and the blackness of the third chapter. And you got to see, though, the abundant and inconceivable grace of God. That's why these verses are so earth shattering and vital in their importance, folks. The Son of God took on human nature to destroy the devil in all his works. As it was announced in Genesis 3.15, and the first step of it was when he came as a baby in the manger. Indeed, how abundant and inconceivable is the grace of God. Let's talk to him now in prayer, shall we? Oh Lord, what more can be said? Lord, I simply pray for your people here today and for any who are lost. I pray the same thing for them, though that they would be amazed, floored on their faces before you, as it were, in the light, in the power, in the earth-shattering glory of the grace of God. Lord, how, how we worship you and thank you that in the midst of our wickedness, just like our forefather and our mother, Adam and Eve. In the midst of our wickedness, our running from you, you said, my son, the seed, he will wash your sins. He will deal with the issue. And you have and you will, Lord, fully and finally when you come, when you reign, when the new heavens and earth are brought in, Lord, we thank you. Oh, may every soul here today know the grace of God. May every soul here today be united to the seed, to the Son, to the Messiah. And may it just fill our hearts with joy and gladness this season. Lord God, what more can we do than praise and thank you? And so we do in the name of Jesus. Amen.